There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you might be around the world, how are you? Of course, I am Jay Campbell and you are watching the Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual StreamYard studio with a young man by the name of Austin Mal. Austin, what is going on, my brother? How are you? Hey, Jay. I love the title, Young Man. I don't feel that way anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you look so young. You have such a baby face. But you guys, uh, Austin is a keynote speaker and the co-founder of Ceremonia, which is a nonprofit and legal psychedel- psychedelic and spiritual center in Denver. And he is a super connected, super conscious brother. And I'm very blessed to have him on today. And we have some insanely amazing talking points. But before we get into those talking points, I'd like to ask you as a very consciously expansive human, uh, and, and again, today is June 27th. I can't believe that we're almost halfway or past halfway point of the year, close to halfway point of the year. It's amazing how fast time is moving now, especially totally. for the spiritually evolved humans among us. Um, where are you on the continuity timeline of humanity from a standpoint of like, say, the next five to seven to 10 years? Are you buying humanity or are you selling <laughs> it's it's so funny because i was just recording with uh zach leary timothy leary's son that's uh, awesome earlier today and we were having this very similar conversation and i shared that i'm very bullish on humanity um and i heard i heard one time that anytime you're in a challenge in life either you zoom in or you zoom out right, right? you zoom in and see what's what's happening for me or you zoom out and you get perspective, yeah. right? And I think if we really zoom out for humanity, there's a lot of really incredible things happening right now. Absolutely. And I get to experience this on a, you know, there's a lot of people that are seeking spirituality now and seeking it in more sustainable, grounded, connected ways. And, and I, from what I am able to observe uh, in my little bubble of the world, sure. Uh, I see a great deal of beauty that's here and that's not to ignore like all the crap that's out there too. Um, but, but I think when we zoom out, there's a, there's a lot to be grateful for. It's awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm totally in agreement and I'm always a glass half full guy, you know, obviously, you know, as well as I do that all we are is our thoughts. And it's like, if you are focused on prosperity and abundance, that's what you get. You know, you can't, the universe does, is not designed to give you anything other than what you're receiving from a manifestation standpoint of your mind. So it's yeah. like, you know, people who get upset or triggered or, you know, have something, you know, again, that they label or define as wrong, go wrong with them, you know, a divorce, and so a death in the family, a loss of a job, a loss of a loved one, whatever. It's still an opportunity for growth and evolution, but you have to look at it from that perspective. And so many people you know, attached to the negativity or the pain or the suffering that, you know, they receive or experience in the immediate, you know, uh, effects or ramifications or permutations when it happens and then never get over that Austin because they attach to that pain that they felt, you know, and then it just becomes a sore thumb or, you know, something that causes, you know, trauma the rest of their life. But, you know, I'm, as a guy who's, you know, almost 54 now, and I really I've always been a seeker, but truly did not become spiritually conscious, aware until I was about 43, you know, after my second divorce and I had my dark night of the soul, which I've had many, but that was the one that was like, okay, you know, what's, what's really, really important now. Um, and you know, now I just look at every opportunity as, you know, to be gratitude, to be grateful for it because it's still, however we define it, an opportunity to evolve and grow through. And I think the more contrast that we have, the more opportunity for growth. Yeah, I imagine that looking back on that divorce now, if you, when you zoom out, you're like, oh, I'm grateful that happened. Exactly. Maybe I was misaligned, whether that be I miss, probably a combination of I'm misaligned with myself, I'm misaligned with this other individual, I'm misaligned with my, or the trajectory of my life. 
And now that created a really sharp alignment for you, right? And Buddha says that we suffer so that we can muster the courage to say, I've had enough of this shit. I'm going to go do something about it. And whether that's something be meditation, psychotherapy, breath work, tantra, or psychedelic work, you're doing something about it, right? Right. And, and, you know, I just heard you say that you, you can view challenges as opportunities right now. My experience is that doesn't just happen overnight, right? It's not like no. we just have a sudden awakening. You're like, okay, every time I stub my toe, what a great opportunity for healing <laughs> that is. But, but what it, um, what that comes from is the repeated iterations yes. of recognizing that when we're in the, in the shit, it is really hard to see, um, the presence and the availability of gratitude, right? And again, when we zoom in enough or when we zoom out enough, we can, we can begin to paint that clearer picture. Yep. It's well said and, and, and hundred percent true, you know, regarding it takes time and, you know, like a lot of conscious life experience and, and really perspective, you know, and it's obviously a choice to become introspective. It's a choice to be contemplative. It's a choice to go out into meditation or sitting still in nature, or, you know, whatever it is that you do, where you can actually connect with your higher self. Uh, and it does take time. I mean, I think, you know, all the great spiritual teachers and sages would say that, I mean, even like with the, you know, Egyptian, the mystery schools, you couldn't even be an adept until you were 40, right? Like they, you had to live four decades to just be considered, to, you know, to become an initiate. So it's like, there is a time in physical incarnation, I think, where you really do have to experience life and you just have to kind of allow the catalysis or, you know, the catalytic events to form you, you know, both physiologically and spiritual. And, you know, and I always think of like what Walter Russell said, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with his work, but he said, you know, the, the journey is, you know, out of the womb into the base of the jungle. And then the, 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 the victory is to the top of the mountain. And, you know, who knows how long it takes and how many iterations and incarnations you know, for most people to get to the top of the mountain. I mean, you know, again, if depending on, you know, what you read or what you, you know, seek as far as knowledge of, of, you know, uh, reincarnation or past lives or any of that stuff, like it, it seems like I would bet money that it takes a while, you know, for a, for a physically incarnated being in third density to get to the top of the mountain. And again, the top of the mountain would just be ascending out of this level of reality to the next round, right? And, you know, depending on your spiritual view, it might be fourth density, it might be five, fifth density or whatever, but it's it's interesting to, 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 to get to that point where you can really truly unpack, you know, your life. And then from a standpoint where you can actually, again, like you said, be grateful for each and every experience. Cause yeah, you I mean, when you're a young kid and, you know, the battle is to get ahead and to have money and have things or, you know, whatever achieve, it's it's a lot different. Yeah, we so we have a podcast ourselves called Modern Enlightenment, right? And the idea that is that 100 years ago, if you wanted to reach the top of the mountain, you'd have to become a horny monk on top of that mountain, right? And now, you know, especially with the proliferation of, of psychedelic work and, and sort of not just the research, but the guidebooks on how yeah. to work with these powerful medicines, we have better tools. Yeah. And so while I 100% agree with you, it takes time, I, I see that time span shortening sure. a lot. And, and that's why I feel so much, so much hope for humanity. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I see the uh, David Hawkins map of consciousness in the sure. back, right? Yeah. Hawkins said, I think it was starting in the, in the late 90s or something that, that um, humanity as a whole started the flip from weakness to strength, from falsehood to truth, from force right. to power, right? right? And once we get there, it's a it's an upward spiral instead of where we were, which was a downward spiral. So so I think what what's happening is with the proliferation of information, yeah. right? And um and I think what is about to happen of AI and that um releasing us from the burdens of minutia right? Which will take some time, but I think it's going to happen. There will be a, a requirement of humanity to step up into creativity, into um, spiritual practice, into embodiment, the things that a computer cannot do, right? right? Or the logical mind cannot do, which is, a, which is what AI is going to begin mimicking more and more and more. 
what do you think of AI? I know we're going off in a lot of different ways in this podcast, but it's perfect. But like, you know, because Musk said something the other day. I mean, I don't want to get into a rabbit hole of Musk, but, you know, he said something the other day about <clears throat> there won't be phones or screens because you will have a chip and you will telepathically or telekinetically communicate, you know, between humans. I mean, do you see that as positive? I mean, you know, I mean, we may, we may disagree on this, but do you see that as positive? So first of all, um, um, the, the, the CEO of Neuralink is a, is a, is a friend. Um, and I think they're doing really groundbreaking work over there. Um, so I'm going to go on a little bit of tangent. The way I view the psychedelic experience sure. is that it's a, it's a compressed focused microcosm of life, right? Like often people relate to experiencing that as years of their life in a few hours. And it's often related to as many years of therapy in, in a few hours, right? And so what you experience and how you meet your experience in that, uh, in the psychedelic is, is mirrors how you act or can act back in life, how you can be and how you can act. I view technology as um, hopefully doing the same thing, right? That our relationship with technology can help mirror and save us from um, from laborious things that are actually not nourishing for us. So mm -hmm. this is an example. Um, when I first got a Tesla, right? I was like, I don't have to turn an ignition on. I don't have to put a key in a hole. I don't have to, to even turn the AC on, et cetera, right? And I was like, wow, I didn't even realize how much effort I am putting into those things, right? Until I no longer had to do those things. And so as it pertains to AI and Neuralink and you know, interfacing through technology, I think that where technology is going to go is to enable us to do less of the of the minutia more of what it truly means to be human. And if I, you know, words are amazing. I'm a poet. I love creating words. And on the other hand, there is some, it can be cumbersome too. When I use a word like God, right? Something, you have an idea of what God is for you. Someone else has an idea of what God is for them. And the differences in our idea, like you might imagine, a bearded white man in the clouds. I might imagine a fat, smiling Buddha. The differences in those ideas separate us. They right. create our division. But ex ideas exist to communicate feelings. Right. And if if we abstract out of the idea and we're in the feeling of what it feels like to be connected with God, I can look at you and be like, hey, you feel that? Oh, I feel that too. And even though we have a totally different idea of what God looks like, sounds like, is gender, whatever it might be, we can connect on the feeling with each other. And so I see the direction of humanity going towards the embodiment, towards the feeling, right? And it's when we are in our thoughts, particularly the thoughts that are like, I have to add 37 cents to 23 cents. What is that number? And that takes energy for me to do, whereas something else can do that, right? I see us, technology as freeing us to feel and freeing us into the imagination. At least that's my hope. <laughs> I mean, you have a good viewpoint on it. I mean, I could go, you know, a totally opposite direction and say it's very dark and it's very inorganic. And, you know, as feeling humans, you know, part of the existence or the opportunity as a feeling human is to, you know, to deal with everything. And to. so I guess, you know, we're obviously a little bit different from an a, a age standpoint, you know, like 12, 13 years, but you're close enough to me that you did have to deal with stuff you know you had to research and you had to dig through things and you know you weren't always yeah, like the thomas of, guide for maps yeah, yeah you weren't exactly. always in front of a computer or, you know had yeah. ai or slash google or alexa or whatever these kids have today is my 14 and 16 year old daughter i think of but um i think the hardest part you know to to wrap that up because you you do have a really excellent viewpoint i and i commend you is you know how do we at the same time teach our children that struggle is required to evolve as a human and that 
not having struggle is like never, you're missing the gift of humanity because again, as a soul, you can't just be given everything. You, 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 there, there, there's a part of you that, you know, requires curiosity. It requires critical thinking, discernment. And I see the bridge or the issue, you know, the called the imbalance is that I think for younger people today, because of technology and because of AI and ubiquitous of, you know, things be, becoming instant, right? Like instant gratification for, so to speak, and almost everything, right? Food answers. It's, I think people, younger people in general are losing perspective because they, they don't understand that there is something about being human where you do have to, again, climb the hill, climb the mountain, you know, it's like, you know, jumping on the bike. And so even though I do agree with what you say, I think that there is a, it's a fine line because there, there has to be some ability as a human to learn through your mistakes, you know. To, to again, to get up on the bike when you don't know how to ride it and fall down. I, I completely agree with you. And, and I think, you know, how we began this conversation is it's a matter of time, mm -hmm. right? Or our perspective of time, right? You know, for example, I'll say two things. For example, COVID, when we were yeah. in the middle of COVID, we were like, this is the worst thing to happen to humanity ever, right? And now that we're out of COVID, hopefully, I think hopefully yeah <laughs> hopefully depends on how much reddit you look at <laughs> um but in the in the theoretical world where we're out of covid right you know there there are many that could say and myself included to say that that was one of the the most extraordinary um flashes of change that humanity has ever catalytic had. it was like, massively yeah. catalytic yeah a hundred percent I mean, the, the, the growth of mental and spiritual health, the prioritization, not only by the people, but by the government is a prime example of that. Yeah. Propelled by COVID and the suffering that generated. I think the same thing is going to happen with AI. I, I read an estimate that by 2035, all human jobs are going to be automated. I mean, there's going to be a ton of suffering that is right. created in that as governments struggle to catch up. Right. Or right. businesses struggled or whatever happens there. Sure. Right? Sure. And, and, but if we zoom out enough, I, I think that there's going to be something extraordinary that we can't even predict right now that will happen. Um, before the internet came out, no one could have predicted the connectedness of, of the world. And at that time, when we were in it, we thought the world had gone to complete shit that at any moment nukes could fall from the sky. Right. Yeah. So, there's, I think that's a matter of perspective. The second thing I'd like to share is um, we use AI in, in our organization in Ceremonia. And I think it's a great example of how AI can be leveraged. We're a, we're a psycho-spiritual organization, right? And we facilitate, by the way, Letting Go by David Hawkins is literally the Bible for our, our sanctuary. Awesome. And, and everybody reads that before coming to our retreats. And where we use AI is, is we, we share prompts that people can, and some training on how to interact with ChatGPT and custom GPTs where they can use AI as a personal coach, right? Then when we do integration over a Chinese tea ceremony, we are recording it with an AI tool called Otter, all right? Yeah, which, no, I'm with Otter. Transcribe. which transcribes, yep. right? And then we give tools, training on how to use that, feed it back through the, the, chat, GB, the chat on ChatGPT. And now you have an AI higher self version of you. And I've used this personally many, many times. I would literally record um, a conflict that I would have with my wife on Otter from the ChatGPT and say, hey, give me tips for my higher self. And it'd be like, here's all the ways that you can show up, not as an asshole, Austin, but like, you know, you can That's show awesome. up better. That having that kind of Look, it's it, it can't replace a human in this case, and it shouldn't replace a human, but it makes something on demand and on and available, particularly those who can't afford to hire an AI. Right. Thing like spiritual connection, the question of like how can technology benefit, it requires out of the box thinking the tool and how those tools get used. Beautiful. Well said. Um, 
you were kind of, we were talking off air before we started the show and, you know, with your Chinese ancestry and your wife is Chinese and Taiwanese, and you were talking about, you know, bridging Chinese uh, tradition with some of the spiritual teaching that you do. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, there's a couple of things that come through for me with that. First, we believe in uh, inspiration, not appropriation, right? I remember, you know, my my lineage or how I learned in the shamanic world is through the path of ayahuasca and watching my teachers invoke the seven directions, you know, work with mapacho, which is tobacco, and master plants, et cetera. There was a phase in my um, quote unquote career as a facilitator where I was like copying those things, but it never felt right for me, right? And which brings me to my second point. I believe that, especially in the psychedelic space, in this this notion of transference, right? If you go to a therapist and that therapist is having a bad day, you're probably going to be okay. But if you go to a psychedelic facilitator and you're going through a session like that and your facilitator is having a real challenge in their life, there can be real transference to you energetically mm. and affect you psycho-spiritually. And so I think it's incumbent upon the facilitator to be as authentic as possible, right? Because what we're effectively doing in a ceremony space, especially, you know, so for your listeners that don't know, a ceremony space is a, a group of people that are usually lying down on a mat, some with blindfolds, some not, and it's deeper than ayahuasca, iboga, whatever the psychedelic is, right? There's no talking or touching amongst the participants. At least that's how we hold ceremony. Sure. Yeah. Performing music, singing, doing rituals, et cetera, et cetera, right? In a scenario like that, what happens is at a neuroscience level, our brains default to childlike states, right? And we can go into that the default mode network and how that works, mm -hmm. et cetera. But suffice you to say that our brains become very malleable and our experience yeah. becomes very malleable, right? And the facilitator at the top is, is um, modeling what it's like to be a parent, right? And the opportunity there is that the facilitator can model stillness, model peace, model love, model all the different things that maybe our parents, when they were stumbling in the dark, didn't know how to model for us, right? <laughs> right. right. And sometimes that that needs, you need to model discipline if it gets chaotic, right? My parents were never modeling stillness, but continue. <laughs> I was curious about that laughter. And, and so as it pertains to, um, you know, bringing in Chinese ancestry and practices, like we read the Tao Te Ching, uh, the Tao before integration, we, we do a Chinese tea ceremony for integration. My wife sings songs in Chinese. That's awesome. We are, uh, our ancestry, it is also modeling for others, the potential of them to come into greater contact with their ancestry. Yeah. Right. I sing songs in Hebrew as well, and uh, we have songs in Arabic. We have many songs in Spanish and and indigenous tribes, et cetera. And we try to bring in lots of different cultures too, not just Chinese. Sure. And that's again because we're modeling the diversity, uh, uh, the the shared humanity uh, across the world. Yeah. Pretty awesome. Um, do you guys do any like Toltec or or? Um... What is the, uh, the, the, uh, the Andy, the Andean indigenous is the, um, shit, I just forgot. I had a, uh, a, a chick, chick, chick one or chick one, which is like the, 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 so that's like the Northern Andean indigenous, um, they're Mayan, but that's what they were called as chick one. And I don't um, know if you guys have those, cause they have those songs too. When you go in the Peruvian, you go into the Peruvian, the high, the high, the Atuplano. And you, and you, you speak, that's the indigenous tongue. It's pretty amazing. They're very, very high spiritual people. They were very, they were like the only ones that were not conquered by the Catholics. <laughs> oh, so you must've gotten something right. Um, yeah, right. uh, my wife and I don't, we also bring in, you know, outside facilitators slash ministers that support and, and we have in ceremony, but you know, what we really stand for is the synthesis between the old and the new science and spirituality, psychology and, and shamanism, you know? And so, um, you, right now we're talking about ceremony or the, psych sure. the actual psychedelic experience, but mm -hmm. 
but what ceremony represents and and what I believe to be the most safe and efficacious way to facilitate um, transformational work, not just with psychedelics, is all the wraparound things that we include. We do workshops from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. We, I believe that integration begins with preparation through tools that empower people to hold themselves, one of which is a familiarity with the map of consciousness and Hawkins' letting go method, which sure. is shared with Gestalt therapy, IFS, and modern psychotherapy. So, you know, um, we have lots of honoring of traditions. And at the same time, as, as in the, with the conversation with AI and, and these tools, it's, uh, I also believe in the, the practicality, the efficacy, the acceleration of the process through modern tools too. Interesting. Do you guys, how do you get around? I mean, I, I don't know the, the, the legal ramifications of, you know, having a, a, a nonprofit that administers, you know, theogens, like, is there an, like, you know, cause what I've been told, like I'm an MEO guy, I'm a five, I'm a toad guy, you know, Bufo. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've done many ceremonies and it's been very cathartic and profound for my life, but it's obviously also a very controlled, regulated, uh, and theogen, right? So it's like, you know, it's like, usually like you whisper it about, you know, when you do that or you do it in Mexico or the rainforest or wherever, but, um, do you guys admit, are you allowed to legally administer that at your, um, your center? Yes. So at the state level, Colorado has natural medicine health act, um, that has decriminalized psilocybin and has a legal framework for licensing that is, uh, coming out this year. Um, I've, heard I've, of that. I've been on the advisory board for training and licensing. So I'm Very part cool. of the legislative process. Um, the, and at the, um, federal level, we are incorporated as a nonprofit church. Um, and, and which where we can operate federally under the religious freedom and rights act serving psilocybin as the Catholic church would serve wine to kids, let's say, right. Right. Kind of right. a similar dynamic. Um, our legal counsel is, um, some of the top in the field and has represented other churches that have successfully sued the DEA and, and done work like that on behalf of churches. Um, and on top of all of that, like we're a church more than just a name. So I imagine that as you've gone through your own processes, you've learned the value of integration. Yeah. We integrate in community. So we meet every Sunday for Sunday service, but it's not me or another minister preaching a sermon. We we meet and we share our challenges and celebrations, right? Our roses and thorns. And then we share, we do a practice called circling, which is a, a, what I consider to be like the default operating system of, of the work that we do at Cerebodia. What, what is, what does circling actually entail just after, after people have experienced an actual real ceremony and partaken, and, you know, just the down, the, the integration and the downloading. How about this? Let's try it on. And then afterwards, I'll ask you how you, how it was for you. And then, um, and then I can share with you what that actually was. Sure. Okay. So Jay, what's it like to be you right now? Amazing. No, what's amazing? I, my, my life is abundant and prosperous. I just, to be Jay Campbell is a gift. Hmm. Truly. I noticed, I saw you smile when you said that, and I'm, I'm curious, like, what does that amazing feel like in your body? It's just a feeling of, um, I'm at ease. I'm balanced. I'm centered. Mm. Yeah. Ease and balance. Is there any, any more? Um, I mean, I love my life, you know, like every day I wake up energized, you know, I mean, you know, I definitely have nights like last night where my got out of bed this morning and I was like, damn, I'm 53. I got some mm. sort of cramp in my side, but, uh, but for the most part through a lot of inner work and meditation, sitting in stillness, you know, I've come to a place where I'm grateful that I live in the time and place that I do. And, you know, I have two little daughters, three bonus children who are older, um, and a beautiful, amazing spiritual mentor wife. Mm. And so I, you know, I live my life truly as every day is a gift. Do you, do you feel grateful in this moment? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And what's grateful feel like? Just to be at ease. It, it, it's, it's, there's no stress, you know, I'm not worried about paying a bill or 
you know, worried about what somebody might think about me. I just exist and I'm conscious of my existence. I, I just noticed myself like, oh, I do an exhale when I heard to be at ease and just to exist. Curious what it's like to share that in such a public forum. Yeah, I mean, I'm a guy that wears his heart on his sleeve and is incredibly transparent in everything that I do. So I have no negative or ill will effects when I speak from the heart center. Mm -hmm. So it's very, it's very easy for me to communicate. You know, and when I'm around another person who's clearly at ease like yourself too, you know, it really lowers my parasympathetic and I'm much more calm and much more centered and much more balanced. And I would even say just in grace. How do you experience balance and in grace right now? It's just, again, being totally centered, having no, you know, outside pressing ideas or concerns or worries or, you know, thoughts, even thoughts, you know, right now I'm just totally present in this conversation with you. Yeah. It seems like presence and also like a, a little bit of focus, like focus too. Super focused. Yeah. Definitely. Wow. What's, it What's it like to recognize that? I'm grateful that you recognize it. Uh, it's amazing, right? Because so many people recognize me for my focus. And so it's, again, it's a gift. And I, and I mm. see it, I see it as, as uh, to just be grateful that I have such a powerful gift. Cool. So that's circling. Very cool. What, and what did you experience as we were going through that process in yourself? Centeredness, that very, very, very balanced, very calm. You know, like I said, like, Knowing, I mean, I know how to put my parasympathetic in a very calm, relaxed state, but it was mm -hmm. even more centered as you and I spoke. Yeah. Would you say that you were feeling more yourself, more of yourself? Yeah, probably. Yeah. So circling is a, came, was born out of gestalt therapy. It's a group process. So imagine 10 of us sitting in a circle doing that for an hour where each person has learned, um, tools right? And the tools that, that you just saw me employ is one is curiosity, right? And there's vertical and horizontal curiosity. Vertical is like, what's that like? Because the first thing you said was amazing, but what you say is amazing might be totally different than what I think sure. amazing is, right? right? Just like on the whole vocabulary of God, right? Mm -hmm. So what's, what's amazing like? And we went from amazing all the way to gratitude, to centeredness, to ease, to, I mean, there was so much that unfurled from what's that like? And then horizontal is like, oh, what else is here right now? Because when we become more conscious, we're able to hold more complexity. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that as you've been in your consciousness journey, you've been able to be pissed off and absolutely loved at the same time. And <laughs> maybe towards kids, you know, it's just like, oh, but if we weren't developing our, our awareness and our curiosity, we wouldn't be able to detect that, right? The second yeah. is compassion, like reflecting back back to you. And I, you know, I imagine that you, you felt heard. You, you shared that it was nice to see that I recognized that. Sure. Right. And third is impact, which is, oh, for me, I took a breath out. I noticed in my own body. And so you impacted me there. See what happens is we're constantly impacting each other and we're mm -hmm. constantly in these states where even let's say you and I were in this conversation in this moment, you're very present and focused. Then you get a ding on your phone. You look down at your phone and I'm looking at you, immediately our connection um, snaps. Yeah. Unconscious for, for both of us until we make it conscious. And what I believe is fundamentally happening in a consciousness experience, and, I, and that goes beyond psychedelics, it could be meditation, right? Is that we are moving from separateness to oneness. Mm -hmm. We are moving from the division the mirage of division between us to co-creatorship, right? Right. And that can only happen when we make the unconscious conscious. We do that through vulnerability, through authenticity, through learning skills that we then practice. And in the practice of the skills, we build our capacity to be with more, more stuff. Stuff. Love that word. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing how people as they get older still focus on stuff, you know, I mean, I see it in my own family. I see it, you know, in peer groups and stuff. I mean, obviously I do thankfully have people that aren't as focused on that in my networks, but it's just, it's crazy, man, for, for 
see people still so focused on materialism and or material things. And I mean, obviously, in, especially in the United States, I mean, this is, this is the birthplace of materialism, you know, the culture of materialism, but it's weird because, you know, you see elderly people who just, man, you know, and again, no judgment or condemnation, but it's like, they just still haven't been able to figure out that it's just stuff. Yeah. One of the most impactful questions that I've learned to ask myself and, and I ask our participants before coming here is what do you want to feel in the moment before you die? Right. And I think usually the answer is peace mm -hmm. is love is connection, love. Yeah. gratitude, proud of a life well lived. Right. Um, those feelings are what we chase after. And unfortunately before consciousness, we bel we do the things to to accumulate the stuff that we believe is going to get us those feelings. Mm -hmm. I go and get the car. I go and get the hot because I believe it's going to bring me love. I believe it's going to bring me peace. I believe it's going to bring me ease. Whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? And that's why I do so much work towards those ends. But the consciousness journey is to discover that doing that is actually what creates suffering. Right. And we get in our own ways. It's the great paradox, right? It is. There's a guru, like Guru Shri Shri Ravikar or something that says, holding paradox is one of the highest states of consciousness. And one of the ways to hold that, the way to hold that is through laughter. Because mm -hmm. sometimes we just got to fucking laugh at how much we work so hard to get the stuff and it's the stuff that actually gets us the suffering. You know, no truer words have ever been spoken. It's well, you amazing. Can Buddha for that. I didn't, I didn't start it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it just, this the idea that mm, you, it, it, it's interesting. You know, I, I, I'm blessed and I, you know, just like you, you know, I have billionaires in my network and I talked to them and I literally spoke to one yesterday and, you know, he paid me a lot of money to speak to me for an hour. And, you know, at the very beginning, you know, it went deep. It went into, it got into a psychological conversation, but, uh, I was blown away at how he was still focused on the material as much as he was being who he was, where he was at his age, he was 78. And it was just, I don't know. I was just kind of like, I don't know. I, I mean, I was fascinated, but I was also kind of humbled because I was like, well, you know, it just goes to show you that money can't buy you everything. Yeah. Like these old adages exist for a reason i mean it's 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 interesting though when you really see the gamut of humanity and psychosocial you know energy and emotions and you know where people are and 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 and, and as you know i mean we get stuck from a very early age emotionally in a lot of things and many of us never overcome that you know we don't integrate we're not doing plant medicine we're not you know experiencing with entheogens or psilocybin or you know whatever you were talking about just stole. I mean, there's so many forms, but it's just, it's interesting when you really look and unpack, you know, where people get to, because, you know, from some perspectives or perceptions, you know, you would say a person like that has lived an incredible life, right. you know, and he's traveled the entire world and he's seen it all. And he's been with this person or this dignitary or this celebrity or this, you know, head of state. And you would think that they would have a different perception. And again, I'm not judging this person, but I was just kind of blown away because I wasn't expecting what he said. You know, and again, I'm not sharing it, but it was just, it was, it was mind blowing for me, literally for about 30 or 40 seconds. It kind of echoed and reverberated in my soul. It's like, wow, without saying it, you know, because I'm listening to him. Totally. And I, and I think I, I was a case of this too, right? Like, um, first in, in the past few years, I've facilitated or been part of the journeys of more than 400 founders. That's and awesome. so I get to see this like play out in real time so often, right? Right. Right. And what's interesting is, um, you know, we, we had a participant who, um, was a combat veteran is a combat veteran, right. And had uh, a pretty complex case of PTSD. Sure. Um, after a hug might be so debilitated, he couldn't walk to the bathroom by himself. Wow. And in the same container, having one of the top C CEOs in the boards, right? 
And what's so fascinating is that um, the program that we run, the it we we're able to create fairly predictable outcomes, which sure. is very very interesting in the psychedelic space, right? Um, and what ends up happening is everyone arrives at the same place, whether you're yeah. CEO or whether you're almost homeless. In the same place as woo woo as it sounds, it's like how do I love myself? How do I feel myself? How do I embrace this messiness that is life? Mm -hmm. Right. And I and I shared like I was an example of this because before doing ayahuasca for the first time, I lived what I call an Instagram life. I was working four hours a week, making 50K a month, uh, traveling the world. I had the biggest Airbnb business in Las Vegas. Nice. <laughs> so very misaligned. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And and I discovered under plant medicine in ceremony that I was running away. I was both running away and chasing at the same time. Sure. Right. We look outside of ourselves where it's impossible to fill the gaping hole inside of ourselves. But the first step that we need to take, the very first step, I think this really begins with safety. So this billionaire uh, client of yours, you know, 78 years old, I also have a friend who's a billionaire that, that um, started the plant medicine path because he had a heart attack in his office in his well, 50s. Right. That's that's definitely a reason to be like, okay, I need to do something differently. Sure. Right. <clears throat> An exercise that I I have people do on our first Zoom call in preparation is revisit a memory of when you felt most safe as a kid. Usually it's like getting an ice cream cone from mom, being hugged by a father, throwing a baseball thing. Feel that feeling in your body. Then um revisit a memory of when you feel most unsafe as a kid, right? For me, it's seeing my mom crying. It's raining in the background, of course. And because she was passing me off to my father after they divorced, right? I was crying too. I didn't understand and feel what that's like in the body. And then now revisit a recent trigger in your past year and also a recent thing that you craved for the past year. And people always notice that the feelings in the body are the same. same. The same. We are fundamentally looking for safety Life seeks to create life. And the first emotional psychologist, Plutchik, said that love is equal to safety plus joy. Yeah. But we need to know how it feels to feel safe. We need to know how it feels to feel unsafe. That's why mindfulness is so valuable in this practice. Definitely. So one of your talking points, and we haven't talked about any of your talking points, but we've had an amazing conversation, is uh, consciousness in relationship and sex. And when I saw that earlier today, I was like, okay, this will be really cool because sex by, by itself is an interesting thing, right? I mean, obviously from a biologically, evolutionary biological perspective, we do it to procreate and keep our species propagational and alive in this planet, you know, full of teeming sapiens sapiens but there is a lot of stuff that goes on in sex from an energetic perspective and you know i think a lot of people i mean well let's just face it most people have no idea like when you're having all these different partners you know there's a genetic and a dna imprint from the sexual conduct or the sexual activity or the you know the fortication the you know copulation every everything that happens there's a genetic and, a, and an energetic uh uh, image and a blueprint and it's you know with those two people for a long time and i don't think most people are very conscious of that but i would be interested in your perspective and you know consciousness in relationships and sex and how important it really is what a what a fun topic um yeah. <laughs> so the bottom rung of that map of consciousness behind of, behind you and the reddest of the red is shame right Humiliate. and and i would posit that sex and sexuality is where people carry the most shame i yes. certainly have in my life for sure it was in my my first ayahuasca experience that i discovered that i was sexually touched as a four-year-old in a way that no boy should ever be touched right that realization or that that uncovering of that memory 
helped herald the renaissance of my life. That's awesome. We just had a particip- we have, and I see this all the time, right? But I am still a work in progress around sex. <clears throat> I was in Turkey um, a month ago um, at this really incredible event called Harvest, and Esther Perel was a speaker there. And Esther is a maybe considered the foremost relationship expert in the world, many best-selling books and uh, psychologists, et cetera. And also French. And I don't know if you know how, how the French can speak. It's like, give no fucks. Like, yeah. I'm going to say it like it is. Right, right. right. And um, the person that went before me was like, oh, I have a friend that does this and a friend that does not She's just like, really a friend. Give it, to, give it to us straight, right? And so I got the mic next and I asked a question in her Q&A. And I started with, uh, I watch porn. <laughs> it's like in front of a hundred people, right? And um, and then she proceeded to ask me what kind of porn I watch. <laughs> and I then see. I was like, okay. Well, and I told me midget porn. <laughs> oh, that's all it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, By and then, bar. Um, I was like. Esther, you're the second person I've said share this with, and the hundred other people in this room. <laughs> right. But what was what was really fascinating about this, and something that I've been working with, is, you know, there are some forms of thought in tantra that there are two kinds of energy in the world. There's energy from up above, and there's energy from down below. Right. Er- eros, the energy from down below, is the sexual creative force, and then the up above is the the force into peace and and harmony. Right. And if we look at um, how we interact with sexuality and the opposite sex or the same sex, whatever your flavor is, um, as a uh, exchange of energy, right? We can start to see how um, how submiss- submissiveness, domination, how our proclivities are representative of the areas in our life that we are not conscious of. And I'll give you an example. Um, um, I think I would be very vulnerable. I, I watch some porn that has domination in it, right? right? And if I zoom out of that, I'm like, oh, where in my life am I not harnessing my inner power and saying, this is what I stand for, or these are my boundaries. This is what I want. And this is what I don't want. How many of your listeners and how many of us have not actually shared with our partner what we truly desire because we're ashamed of it, mm. right? And, and as I imagine you know through work with David Hawkins' work, anytime we bury something, right, we are burying it under other layers of feelings. Yeah, and rest. if you are um, a fan of Internal Family Systems, IFS, there's a book, No Bad Parts, and we don't have bad parts, but some of those parts can have shitty strategies. And one strategy of shame, the parts that carry shame, is pride, right? Because pride exists to hide shame. So I might postulate and I might go and create a big company and, and like call myself a leader and lead people this way and demean them and blah, 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 so that I feel inflated, right? The, the process under pride is inflation. And that is there to hide the underlying shame that's underneath. Right. And so sexuality can, you earlier talked about challenges to opportunities, like sexuality can be such an incredibly valuable portal for people to explore the energy states that are, that are really deeply hidden underneath. Beautiful. Let me give you this one statement and then I'll let you go. And this has been amazing. True or false, the most important thing in life is managing your energy field. Um, I, I think false and just because of the word most important. <laughs> <laughs> well, explain, go deeper. I think managing your energy field is a consequence of what I might say is the most important thing in life and the most important I, and I haven't thought about this exact sentence stem, but if in this moment, what I believe to be the most important thing in life is to, um, 
to be, to feel oneself, to allow oneself, to love oneself, right? Just to be in the highest state of consciousness on your map of consciousness over there in the state of enlightenment, the view of life is just is. Life just is. Right? I, actually. No, it is just I. It's I? The view of life? Are you sure? Definitely. Okay. Um, I think the view of God is self. But anyways, um, that, <laughs> there's, a, <laughs> there's an isness to experience, right? Definitely. And, and I think when we have the experience of being embodied and self loving self first self accepting and self loving yes we act in a way that is constantly true to ourselves and in that situation if we're acting in a way that's true to ourselves then there is no ne necessity of management right. it just happens right, right? Well, and and it says and it speaks to your feeling that you spoke to earlier of ease effortlessness when we're efforting it's because there's some level of resistance in our system and so the more that we can just allow ourselves to exist and be, I think the, the more ease that we bring into our lives, our relationships, our purpose, and what we, how we are. It's beautiful, man. So I would just say, I mean, I don't disagree, but I would just say like, and you kind of brought it up multiple times in this, but the most important thing in life is loving and trusting yourself. Because if you can't love or don't love and trust yourself, you can't be. You're constantly a battle, right? You're constantly, totally. you're constantly seeking, challenging, desiring. It's, you know, again, we're going into Buddhism here, but like, that's the hardest thing because we're so taught from birth not to love and trust ourselves. We're so taught to seek the external validation to, right. you know, to, to find value outside of ourselves. And it's like, it's mind blowing, you know. And this is, you know, something, I mean, this has been a beautiful podcast, man. I'm really grateful that I met you and that we had this conversation because it was amazing. But, uh, I think we're the, that the technological issue is where, you know, more and more people are finding value in the technology and less in introspective work. And like you said, cause I agree with you and I never really looked at it. I'm great. I'm glad that you challenged my viewpoint on this cause it's very discerning, but, uh, you said that AI will allow us to do to get rid of minutia. But I think that's coming from an enlightened viewpoint such as yourself. And I don't think that most people look at it from that perspective. Again, it's my opinion. But if we could get it, get more people to look at it from that perspective, I think it would be insanely beneficial and that what you're saying about AI will make a lot of sense. But I just, I, I just think that there's enough technocracy that isn't let's just call it service to self and not service to others that can really, you know, demean or, you know, really diminutize the idea that you have about it, that it will less, it'll make people have less tedious things to do. My, you know, minutia is the word you use, but cause that's a beautiful view, viewpoint and perspective, but I don't know enough. I, I guess my get, my point is I'm saying, I don't think enough people share that. Totally. And you know, what we can do, like, I, I don't really watch the news anymore or read yeah. the news, right? Because there's only a limited amount that, that we can do. And for those listening to your podcast, I'd say focus on yourself and the love and the loved ones around you, yes. right? If you are worried about what's happening a world away, the wars, the genocide, the, you know, the famine, I mean, of course, continue to be a good human in, in the global scheme of things. But the, the best that we can do is, is for what's in close proximity for us. It's what, yeah, beautiful. I mean, it's, it's what we control, which is not much, you know, we not much at all. Yeah. We control, we control our energy field. You know, we can choose to respond out of love or we can choose to react out of fear. And most people don't choose when they react out of fear. Right. Right. So. But you're right. I mean, again, the external is only causing imbalance and incoherence and disharmony. I mean, yeah. that's ultimately what it does. And, and, but it is, you know, the conscious choice of us as individuals, as physically embodied or incarnated beings to, to realize that. Yeah. And it takes, it can take a long time, you know, in a, in a person's lifetime to actually realize that. And as you know, I don't, I, I, I would argue that some people 
it takes many lifetimes before they get to that level of awareness. I, I experience everything you just shared as truisms. And for me, what I feel greatly concerned with and, and where I'm dedicating my life is not the what, it's the how. Beautiful. Right? How do we accelerate our consciousness? How do we learn the tools? How do we grow our capacity? How do we meet ourselves? Right? We could have a trip to the cosmos, but what matters is here on earth right now. Right? So you can do a ton of psychedelics um, and meet God every other day. But if you're still an asshole in life, you know, right. if you're not impacting your relationships and your, your beingness, your purpose, your business in a, in a meaningful way that's sustainable, then what's it all for? Mm -hmm. And so the how is really what I, what I am devoting my life to. And I hope I get to share that with you someday, Jay, in, in Ceremonia, because yeah, there's something really special cooking up here and in Colorado too. It's awesome, Austin. I, I think that might happen. Okay. So let me throw ceremoniacircle.org, which you get is your company and your site. And um, I mean, I definitely want to find out more. It definitely sounds amazing. And everything that you shared today was, I mean, I would use the word profound. I mean, you're pretty, I, I don't use the word enlightened very often, but you are, you're on that path for sure, based on your, your awareness and your knowledge. And uh, I'm just, again, grateful that you were able to come on here today and share. I'm somewhere between, uh, exactly, he was saying this on, on the podcast I just recorded with him, somewhere between a, a spiritual badass and a spiritual fool. <laughs> and probably that's actually the best place to be, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, not, nothing to find. Both will, at again, the same time. Yeah. I mean, thank you, my brother. So again, ladies and gentlemen, and all the amazing people that watch the Jay Campbell podcast, as always, support the incredible individuals that come on. Go to uh, Austin's website, which is Ceremony at Circle. Dot org check him out and consider uh joining one of their circles and of course remember raise your vibration to optimize your love creation we will see all of you guys very soon